What are the pillars for someone to go from earning six figures to seven figures that they need to overcome to be able to achieve that? You know, there's so many aspects of the business that can be improved and become more efficient, right? So you have to get control of your schedule, right? You have to be better on your pre-qualification questions. You have to be better on your listing presentations. And all these are skills training and, and taking time to practice it and follow your rules, right? You said four things, wake up early, work out, role play, prospect three hours, join a mastermind group. That's the key formula for a seven figure agent. Why do you think it's hard for other agents to buy into that? There's a few things. I think complacency sets in for many people. And I think complacency sets in because it's different for everybody, right? But they may not see themselves as that person. They not Maybe they weren't around it. and. They just really don't want to be around it in, in reality. Everyone says they want to make a lot of money, but not everybody's willing to go do what it takes, right? Not everyone's willing to do with the, deal with the pain. World-class lessons from the real estate industry's top 1%. Empowering agents to think bigger and do more to create life by design. Get access to exclusive interviews with top producing real estate professionals. Listen in as we talk about their journey in the business Best Practices and Lessons Learned. Hosted by Kiro Nasrallah and John Scipioni. You mean one thing that we always say in our office is just action is better than perfection, right? This is Light It Up with Lighthouse Residential. All right, you guys, welcome back to another episode of Light It Up podcast. We are super excited about today's guest. We have with us out of Hermosa Beach, California, Mr. Ed Kaminsky. Ed, thanks so hey. much for being here. Thanks, You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate so, it. Of course. So Ed leads the Kaminsky Real Estate Group. Uh, his team will do roughly 140 deals this year, representing around $300 million in total volume. Uh, certainly a heavy hitter out in California. And uh, we're just excited to have you here and speak a little bit further about you know, some of these top producing agents on your team. Sure. That's great. Awesome. So, you know, we always like to have people on the platform who can, um, you know, dig deep or go deep on certain subjects. And and uh, I know you and Kiro had talked in the past about uh, some some agents on your team, you know, on their way to make over a million dollars in uh, in income per year or per calendar year. I know you have at least one agent who's doing that on your team right now. So, um, of course, that's always a number that gets a lot of people out there really excited. So let's dig a little bit deeper on that and and figure out, you know, how you were able to to you know, develop some of these top producing agents. Yep. But before we jump into that, Ed, <laughs> we have some fire round questions. So we like to start with this lightning round. It's, uh, it's a little funny. And what we used to do was we did this at the end of the episode. And then we realized we got everybody all excited and all uh, you know, pumped up. And uh, John then we ended that the every episode. single time. Can well, we, we have to. Questions. <laughs> all right. Um, we're going to do two or three questions in total. Um, Ed, what's one big thing that's on your bucket list? A big thing on my bucket list. <clears throat> I mean, it's really just increasing the number of countries I visited. Uh, I have a goal of a hundred, and I'm a a long, long ways away. <laughs> so I got to figure out <clears throat> how the heck to get out of the office so I can go see them all. But it's really <laughs> just ticking them off. You know, putting a little pin in the map. Nice. How many did you go through so far? Uh, it's 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 probably fifteen, right? It's not a ton. I got that's why I say eighty five left to go. Cover, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna Ed, hold you accountable, but I got another one here for you, Ed. In which activity would you like a lesson from an expert? Ooh, you know I seek out experts all the time, right? So everything I'm trying to do better, whether it's health, it's business, it's real estate, it's investing. Um, <clears throat> I'm seeking it out constantly. I can't even think of something that I really want to do better that I haven't asked for advice, but I think it's a great question. I, I think we all should be looking for those things. Awesome. Sure. Yeah. Last question. What do you most admire about your parents? Uh, well, they both have passed, but um, two different things, like from mom and dad, right? So <clears throat> mom was just a kind person, right? She was kind to everybody. It was a great attribute to have. And my dad <clears throat> worked for himself and he had like 50 different careers in his lifetime. So he always had to be in control. Um, and what I liked was his, you know, his passion to, to build something new. 
I think he could have stuck with one or two th or three great ones and, you know, maybe more, succeeded more in one or two or three of those. But I think just having the gumption to go out there and do it himself, I thought was, was great. Yeah, which leads me into the first question because, uh, Ed, you are one of the most successful self-made uh, real estate business owners. Um, you have several different businesses aside just from the real estate team. Um, and you really started completely on your own with zero advantages and you've created everything from the ground up. Um, for the people who don't know you, can you share that story with uh, the viewers? Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> when I started, um, like everybody else that has nothing, right? I didn't come from money, right? My parents were divorced and didn't have a lot. So I just did what I had to do to get myself at least into school, right? Because they weren't going to be able to pay for it. So I didn't have an, <clears throat> I didn't have the enough to go to, you know, a full blown college. So I took a trade school in the jewelry business. And that was my first career. And when I went into the jewelry business, I think the first thing I learned was sales, right? Just learning to be a better salesperson. So when you're 18, 19 years old, learning that you're, you got a young, you know, mind that's, you know, learning all those things. I moved into real estate when I was in my twenties, so maybe 26. And I was already a dad at age 21, uh, twice over at 23. So I had responsibility. I didn't have an option to not succeed. Right. So I just, just did it. Right. I went out and <clears throat> prospected three or four hours every day. I worked seven days a week for a long time, but I was going to put food on the table and I was going to become successful. So <clears throat> the first thing I did was just look at people that were doing better than me in my market and just trying to follow whatever the heck they were doing. I picked up some like fairy tapes, cassette tapes or these little square things, you know, that span. Have you ever seen them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I just listened to that all day in my car. Um, and started implementing those things. And I, I always had like this steady growth. Um, year one was 17 deals. Yeah. And then it just kind of grew from there. I got my first assistant and I got a second assistant. And I would just go on a steady line up for quite a few years. And then once in a while I'd come back from a, usually a Mike Ferry event, superstar retreat, and get one like trigger that was gonna elevate the business another level. And there was a couple of those. One was actually maybe, you know, part of the topic today was I was going to make a million dollars in one year. Now, the most I had made up to that point was 400000 So it was a pretty big jump. <clears throat> so I had to use mindset first because I really didn't have the belief and full confidence that I could do it. So Tom Ferry was my coach at the time. And he made me say that I was going to make a million dollars for an entire 30 minute coaching call to him. <laughs> I found out later that he was actually at home at his pool and he just wanted to just hang out at his pool and he just put me on, <laughs> on the ground. And I didn't know he wasn't listening. <laughs> we'll but, make sure we tag him when we post that clip. Yeah. <laughs> what I, um, he was a great inspiration, but, but the, the that month, which was January, um, I was so committed to to doing it. I got to a hundred thousand dollars in escrow by the seventeenth of January. Amazing! Wow, that created the belief, right? So once I hit it, and I hit it in three weeks or less than three weeks, I knew I could repeat it, and I needed that piece of evidence. Um, and so it continued, and and I cracked a million bucks that year, of course. So. Amazing. Now my goal is to figure out how to do that in a month. How can I make a million dollars in one month driving that much revenue through my company? I believe it's possible because I've gotten close to it, you know, many months. So I just got to figure out how to repeat it 12 times in a row. Just leave a 30 minute voicemail to Tom Ferry saying my, I will make a million dollars in one month. <laughs> That'll be the secret right there. That's amazing. Um, and then how did you go from, and I think, everybody has this struggle of being a successful independent salesperson to developing a team. And there's almost like a, a shock there. How did you transition into team owner, team lead? There's been what I've done for the last 32 years, right? 
when I, I was just building a business that was operated and run by me and my team that was around me to support everything I was doing. But I'm, I was the main breadwinner, main listing agent, main buyer's agent. And then, and then I farmed out a lot of buyers when I got a buyer's agent or two buyer's agent, a pretty great elite, you know, fine tuned team that could do just that. But growth really became hard when I'm in that role. Mm. Because it, really the only way to do more was figure out how to become more efficient or find more time. And there was none left, right? There just was none left. So to scale the business, I have to I had to really learn, which I've learned through the pandemic, how to resource great people, right? Having adding great people to the team that can help build, help list, and help sell, and so that's the only way to scale these to the numbers that are, I think, achievable. Yeah, and your commitment to it is impressive because when when we were talking in San Diego and we were talking about EOS, um, you you had so much conviction behind it that you said, "I hired two EOS implementers right off the bat," and that's because my commitment was so strong to it. And then I decided who I wanted after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, so with EOS, which is out of the book Traction, if you don't know, um, is an entrepreneurial operating system. And it it teaches you how to run the business like a business instead of the business running you. How to structure it, how to find the right people, the right people in the right seats. And committing to that process was critical. And yes, I did have to find an implementer that could help me move it along. And I, I did. I hired two people and they were both great. Yeah. But I didn't need to, you know, forever. So I got, you know, the one, the one's job was to design how to get from implementer or, or integrator rather from integrator to out of the company. A great fractional EOS person is figuring out how they can shore you up and get out. How you can replace yourself. So that's what you look for in these integrators. And, and then you can hire your own full-time integrator that's, you know, not fractional. So that's another way to start is fractionally. Yeah, It's like in a consultant or a part-time person, but it's a very f- affordable way to, to, to do it. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, it's amazing how much EOS comes up on uh, the podcast, right? On each of these podcasts. Yeah. yeah. So many people have, uh, you know, ha- have heard a lot about it and are sort of, you know, uh, hesitant to pull the trigger, but then there's a lot of people who are just saying, Hey, we implement it every single day and it's changed our, it's changed our business. So, yeah, I mean, adding some structure to how you operate your business is important and understanding who should be pushing what buttons is important. <clears throat> a lot of you guys, I'm sure are, are visionary and somebody's operational and understanding which one are you, cause you're usually not both either. And we, we as agents can, can choose to be both and be very happy and very successful. But it's when you want to scale it to some level that you've never been to and, and, and are having challenges getting to is when you start to understand the difference between a visionary and an operations person or an integrator and allowing them to shine in their respective roles. Yeah. And, and what are you in your, in your business? I'm a pure visionary. Pure visionary? So, I am. I mean, I ran, ran operations forever for most of my career, but yeah. but I shouldn't have been, right? Because I have a new idea every day. Yeah, every that's this guy. Day. It's like, he's, oh he's my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so, that's a struggle. you know, I need a good integrator next to me that says, another great idea, but we're going to go ahead and put this one in the, in the back drawer for right now while we work on the other 16 that you wanted to implement. And, um, so I need that at my side because my ideas are amazing, but you really can't do them all. It's it's impossible. Well, speaking about ideas, you know, Ed, can you talk a little bit about your auction business? So aside from your just residential real estate business, you started multiple businesses based out of necessity to capture a niche in each kind of your marketplaces. Can you go into those? Yeah, a bit? I, for sure. So <clears throat> as I started growing in the business, I understood that, you know, the clients and and where we source them from all have different situations. And so once I understand that situation or that niche, and my question always comes back, like, how do I repeat that? How do I blow that up? And so um, when I started the auction company, it was about helping 
property owners that had really big, unique, special properties find a different way to get it marketed and sold. It was designed for sellers who wanted the property sold and they were willing to accept market value and they want to know what it is, right? Mm. And it, for these hard to value properties, there's only one way to figure that out. You bring it to the market and let the buyers decide. What the buyers say it's worth, that's, that's what it's worth, right? It's not the seller's opinion. It's not my opinion. It's not an appraiser's opinion. It's what the buyers will actually pay for. So the auction process solved that problem. And I built that company and ran it for 20, almost 20 years. But I've since sold that company. Uh, I don't <clears throat> run it anymore, but I still uh, partner with some of the auction companies out there to use that process with auctioning the house out this month in town. Awesome. That's awesome. And then the other niche that I ran into same time was with athletes. I uh, started a company called Sports Star Relocation. And that was driven out of initially my normal competitive nature because I got one player and I helped him in LA. And I said, I should have them all. I mean, all players should Naturally. work with Ed, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I made the decision one day that, that all athletes are mine. And I saw another player come to LA and they didn't work with me. So I was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized I was the only one knew, I was the only one that knew I was actually the realtor for all athletes in the world. So <laughs> um, I had to change, you know, how I thought about it. So the first thing I thought was, okay, how do I, how do I get to them all? Right. Mm. And so I said, why don't I find every real estate agent across the country who also works with athletes and then tell them I'm here, stamp them a sports star agent and say, okay, anybody moving to LA, you got to call me. So that was, that was kind of the birth of it. But again, mm. that business growth thought pattern of being competitive and wanting all the business was not going to earn it from the customer, right? The, the athlete, it was all about me and it's not the right way to build any business. So I started thinking, okay, what do they need? What do these players want? So when they're ripped out of a city, you know, it's exciting for those that watch and say, oh my God, he got a hundred million dollar contract. He must be pumped. But the reality is he goes home, he's got a wife, he's got two kids and he got to pull the kids out of school. The wife has to get new friends and a new hairdresser and everything else she's just got comfortable with. And they're not happy, honestly. Mm. Everybody loves the money. But the truth is the relocation process sucks for a lot of different reasons. So <clears throat> I said, let's build something that would serve the players and the spouses and the families to help them a little bit more and, and provide a concierge level type of service. that will help them get their cars moved and find them a new hairdresser or chef or whatever they need and just be more full service for the players. So that was what allowed it to actually grow was looking out for their, their needs. Mm. And this is kind of how I move forward. All my niches now is just trying to understand the customer's issues, talk yeah. about what they are with them. Stop focusing on, you know, that, yeah, I, I sell more homes than anybody else. And I sold, you know, $8 billion in property. I mean, nobody cares. They really don't. They care about what's causing problems for them and that you can solve it. And so everything we're doing now, our scripts, our dialogues, our marketing is all based on customers' issues. That's a good realization too, when you think about it, right? It's like when you're focusing on yourself, you only get so far, but when you're focusing on solving problems for others, it's just, they just get naturally attracted to you. Yeah. Um, and I think when you're in one of those niches, you work with a handful of players, you start realizing like, Hey, like you said, it may not have occurred to you at first to offer them a service that moves their cars. But by the time you get to the second or the third athlete, you're like, okay, I already got a guy, right? Or I got somebody who can handle this, or I can, you know, I can connect you with this sort of person. So, you know, you're building it as, as, as you go, but you know, uh, it becomes a full, full concierge. Yeah. So Ed, one of the things, uh, as we get into the topic of building bil uh, millionaires, I was gonna say billionaires, that'd be nice. Um, <laughs> the millionaire, uh, creation, one of the things that's very visible in your organization, Ed, is your culture is so strong. 
Um, even when in Vegas, when your whole team is there, everybody's, it almost looks like a very tight niche group on your social media. You have everybody participating in some of the things that you're doing. Uh, you can be very open and honest and transparent with your agents, even when you're in the car with them and talking with them. How did that come uh, to be? You know, it was, <clears throat> When I have the right people in the office, there's always been a, I, I would say a great culture, right? I, I felt that taking care of my team was always important. Then people mixed into my team that, that honestly messed up the culture, right? It just, it was a bad culture fit. Things didn't work out. And I experienced some things that were terrible. And the last time I went through it, it was so bad that I thought, I'm never going to allow that to happen again. And so I moved toward, towards culture as being number one in my hiring process. We designed what is our, what is it through EOS, they take you through an exercise on how to build your culture words and what they mean. Um, and then <clears throat> how to share it with the team. And, you know, we had a whole full team meeting where I, I introduced it all, broke up the team into the different and had them participate, right? You got to get buy-in. <clears throat> you can't just pitch it and expect them to just buy into what culture you want. You got to see if they're willing to, to be a part of that. So if I say, you know, um, teamwork is a part of our culture, then I would give the, the T to that table and say, okay, you tell us what does teamwork look like to you as a group? You, you discuss that right now. And then you're going to come back in front of the group and express the two or three or four things that really exemplify teamwork in our company, right? So instead of me coming at them with all the ideas, you have to bring them in off it. Um, and then it's right people, right seats, right? Having leadership that really is focused on growing the team and <clears throat> picking up where maybe your weaknesses lie, right? I don't run around all day long saying good boy good boy or a great job right i i can't help but just see what went wrong right we can do this better that was a mistake oh my god how did that happen and i see that all day long and then i point it out that's bad leadership mm. there's ways of communicating that but it's got to be mixed in with some greatness right a lot of attaboys and if you don't do it then you better hire somebody that can help bring that culture level up and make them feel good all day long. And, and I've been able to bring that in. So awesome. that's been really a big change. And you're still in production, correct? I am in you production. Personally? I tried to figure out how to get out um, because I designed <laughs> the system to allow us to grow and me shrink, right? How much production I'm doing. And so the goal was to take me from, you know, 70% of the volume down to 5% of the volume. And so when I first started it, um, I couldn't create enough volume from the team in my mind yet to step up. So I'm stuck right there, right? So I'm in this transition. I know there are others that either start with just building a team and don't do any production, there are others that just said, oh, I figured it out and I'm going to, I'm going to step out. I mean, uh, Josh Barker comes to mind cause he, he closed his company when, uh, the pandemic hit and went on a sailboat ride for a year. Yep. And then he came back and said, I'm going to start and I'm never going to sell another house again and talk to another client. Again. And he's just yep. doing it. Right? So I'm yeah. going to just freaking go do it. I got to muck up the waters pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here mucking with you too, man. So, except you're mucking at a much higher price for, price point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of it. Our, our price range allows me to step in and kind of fix the top line revenue by doing a few deals. And that really makes a big difference. Yeah. Well, let me ask you though. I mean, that so, you know, we do a lot of these podcasts with people and a lot of times we're talking about recruiting and adding agents to your team. You know, I mean, our average price points, let's say 650,000. Uh, if we have a newer agent that was just licensed, but they've got great sales skills, usually we can teach them the real estate business and, and usually, you know, give them the, the reins to go work with buyers pretty early on. Uh, do you find that at a higher price point, it's very hard to bring in newer agents? Are, are most of the agents that are joining your team 
you know, uh, coming with three, five, seven years experience? Uh, no, the new, uh, <clears throat> we, we definitely can attract the newer agents. It's, it's, it's tough, right? And you can't throw them in the high end right away because the, the really high end, they, they've got pretty high expectations of what you should know and your knowledge. Hmm. But fortunately, we're in LA and we have every price point. We, got, we have $600,000 homes and we have $60 million homes. So they can find their way into what works for them. The one thing I've discovered is that um, I can't judge what's going to really happen when I first meet somebody. It's really tough, right? I've seen people come into the market and succeed pretty well in the high end pretty quickly. Hmm. They've got this kind of natural charisma and people like them and they're like, they don't care what they don't know. They're just good with people and it's fine. And then you got others that are newer and they couldn't talk their, their selves out of a paper bag. Right. right. So <clears throat> I, I took the, that path. I took the path of learning to just sell a lot of homes in a really low price point. I want When I started, I just want to know how to sell 50 houses in one year. I didn't care what price they were. And so that's what I did. And I went to the lowest price areas in my marketplace. So for those that know Southern California, I was in Gardena and Carson and Hawthorne and Lawndale and selling $200,000 homes at the time. And then once I sold 50, somebody asked me, Ed, what are you doing over there? You know, my office was in a high end neighborhood. And then I thought, what the hell am I doing over there? And I just stopped. That was one of my big aha moments when I said, that's it. I'm out. I'm out of that neighborhood and just stopped. I said, I'm working where my office is now. But I had the confidence at that point. I had sales skills and I had a lot of knowledge of how to do a transaction, how to represent the clients and where you can screw up and right all the mistakes that you make. But they were done over there. Now I can do them over here. And I literally just switched and started only working the high end as far as active prospecting goes, active right. lead generation goes. If something came up on the lower end, I'd still handle it. I would never say no to something, but I wasn't looking there anymore. Right. And I think that's from what I hear you saying is, is, you know, I think in the MFO system, we were always taught worry about, you know, the number of transactions you're doing. You can always increase your price point later. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, get, get comfortable doing 25 deals a year, 50 deals a year, and then you can slowly increase your price point. Um, because I think there are a lot of agents, of course, right, we're right outside of Manhattan and there's a lot of agents in Manhattan that will do one or two deals, you know, five, $10 million, and then, you know, probably be on a boat for the rest of the year. But, um, I remember you speaking specifically in February in San Diego, talking about how you did increase your average price point. And you said, I figured out what areas I wanted to be in. And I did a lot of a hell of a lot of like, uh, just listed, just sold calls. Some of them were not even on my own listings. Right. And you said, you know, that, that's the beauty of the, that type of call. You can specifically pick which neighborhoods you want to be in. Yeah. And then uh, I, my, my goal is to get one little something, right? I either had a buyer or I had a seller and it worked the heck of, of, of the, around it, right? So if I had a listing, then I was door knocking all, all week before the open house and I'd be the open house. I would be there and meet somebody. I would cold call the neighborhood after I got the listing and I could talk about, you know, that listing. Or if I showed property, I loved showing property and I would show the 10 homes in that neighborhood. And then when I would cold call at night, I knew every single house because I just went in and I just showed it. Right. It wasn't just looking at a screen, but I really knew the homes intimately. So those conversations got better because mm -hmm. um, I could talk about, you know, the home on the blue house on Maple or whatever it was. So coming off with knowledge to the customer on the phone created a better opportunity, a better relationship, better chance of getting another deal. Yeah. So now with your average price point being around 2.1 million, is that right? It's around two and a half million. Yeah. Two and a half million. So the, an agent would have to hit about uh, 35 transactions in total to net or to gross around a million. Is that accurate? 35? Well, no, sorry. Oh, 20. A lot less. Yeah. Sorry. Like 17 maybe. So what I did is I created um, a formula that can show you exactly what you have to do 
And does the formula tell you like the amount of transactions or the activities associated with it as well? It's it's everything, right? So it's um, how many deals you got to do, and then how long it's going to take you to make a million bucks. This. This is the early version, but it should work. I'll show you anyways, because instead of um, trying to find the, the best one. All right. So I don't know if this is sharing, but do you it see is, yeah. volume breakdown analysis? Yeah. Okay, good. So let's just say you want to make uh, $250,000, right? You just type that in there. Mm-hmm. And then it'll, this will adjust. So if your average commission you're going to earn is $10,000, Uh, and you're going to do 20% of your business from listings and 80% from buyers, it tells you exactly what you got to do for the course of the year. Now, uh, this is to tell you how how many leads you have to get and and what you got to do, how many presentations you have to make. The fun part is the millionaire formula when you go here, and it tells you if you make $250,000 this year, how long before a million dollars is going to end up in your driven into your bank account? So you can see by year three and a half, you should have a grand total of earning $1.3 million. So I'm, I'm not making it all sound like, okay, who, who can make a million dollars per year? How can you get to a million dollars? If you can get it done in four years, can you shorten it to three years, right? Yeah. So this is the formula to do that. So you'll see if someone's earning 400000 a year, Up over to the formula, you know, by year two and a half, they've, they've put about a million dollars in. By the end of year three, they've, they've made a million four. And it's a pretty simple formula. It's just the belief that you can grow your income by 20% per year. Let's just be realistic, right? Yeah. If you're going to be an overachiever and you can double your income, good for you. But, but if you just increase by 20% a year, you can get to a million dollars. You can get to a yeah. million dollars in income in, in six years. But you've been dr- drove this much money into your account through that time, so yeah. that's how that works. It's hard to have that belief or that thought of twenty percent when you did it yourself two point five x, right? So two hundred fifty percent in from the four hundred thousand to the million that one year. Um, what do you what do you but say? It's not people? the average person, you know. The average person out there is is, is 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 you know, like we say all the time, right? It's uh, can't expect everybody to do what you're going to do, but. No, but it's it's realistic to expect 20% growth per sure. year for 90% of the people out there. You may have those amazing years where you're like, bam, I just doubled my business from the year before because I did everything right and everything just fell into place. Or I finally broke through a bad mindset I had or I created some new habits that are really effective. So yeah. those can create those 40 50%, 100% jumps in business. Uh, so that's possible. But if you want to look at it realistically, 20% growth per annum is a pretty realistic goal to set for someone. So one thing that you said that when when you did the coaching with Tom Ferry um, and having the mindset, that's one of the things you focused on. What are the pillars for someone to go from earning six figures to seven figures that they need to overcome to be able to achieve that? You know, there's so many aspects of the business that can be improved and become more efficient, right? So you have to get control of your schedule, right? You have to be better on your pre-qualification questions. You have to be better on your listing presentations. And and all these are skills training and and, and taking time to practice it and and follow your rules, right? If you know what the rules are before you go on an appointment, follow them, right? And, And there's so many that we all have gone out on appointments we shouldn't have been out on yet, right? We didn't ask all 27 pre-qual questions. We just yeah. figured we can wing it when we get there, right? That's a mistake. We didn't have time to do a CMA before we got there. Figure we can whip it out on the computer, you know, when we get there. Or I don't know, we'll figure it out. So creating efficiency in every part of your business and then having, you know, the right people in the right seats, right? So if you've got the wrong people being bold enough to either train them up to where they got to go or train them out, if that's what needs to happen. So there's so many aspects in the business you have to look at from customer service, customer experience, to what you're saying, what your team is saying, what, what words are using, um, you know, are you building a past client 
database that's being effectively marketed to? Or are you just counting on email that goes into their spam and they never even see it? You know, do you have direct mail going out? Do you have phone calls going out? Do you have them writing reviews? Right, you got to hit it everywhere to have that kind of exponential growth. Um, and you got to be thinking about it all day, every day, that this is what you want. And you got to wake yeah. up in the morning saying, okay, I, I'm, I've got my five key rocks that have to happen for the company this quarter. Is somebody working on all of those rocks? Your main goals. Yeah. No. Let's dig a little bit deeper on the agent on your team that you said is is uh, is going to make over a million this year. Uh, we don't have to name names, but what are some characteristics that you think they demonstrate that uh, you know are, are uh, of course, the reason that they're producing at the level they're producing at? Well, fifty percent of her DNA is me. The other fifty percent is my ex-wife. So that's a start. <laughs> She's got a leg up. There you go. Yeah. But she didn't. So the, the thing is, Only DNA. She, well, I meant a leg up because she's got your DNA. <laughs> she didn't succeed because of that. She didn't right. succeed because of favors. She was. She went out. She went to college. She worked for me when she was seventeen or eighteen, and she was loud and yelling across the thing, "Dad!" You know, I was like, "Oh my god, it's so unprofessional." <laughs> but then she went to college, got a degree, worked for some tough people. Right. Learned what it was to have a, a boss and, you know, and understand that relationship. So when she came aboard the second time in her, you know, later 20s, whenever it was, mid 20s, um, she understood the, that relationship. And now she was open to listening. And I basically told her to do everything that Mike Ferry told me to do. Right. <clears throat> Get up early and work out. Do role playing at 7 a.m. or 7.30. Get on the phones by 8 o'clock and you prospect for three hours. Don't ever let anybody interrupt you. Don't break that schedule for anything. Get in a mastermind group and just hone your sales skills and do it every day, five days a week, right? If you just follow that schedule and you do that, you'll become successful. All the people have come through these doors. She's the only one that really, truly just did it, everything. Like she's committed to working out in the morning. She's committed to her role play. She's committed to three hours of prospecting every day. She has her own mastermind group. She goes to training. She has her own coach. Does everything absolutely that was how it was designed to do. And she won't break from it. Hmm. So she makes a million bucks a year by following those rules. And <clears throat> I think anybody could follow. And it didn't happen in two years, right? It took time. It took years to build that and build a past customer database and, you know, be good at networking and, you know, connecting. And, now, you know, she's married to a guy in, a, in the financial world and he's got connections. So she works those connections and just really being aware of building business every day. I, you know, I ask this question, yeah. mostly new people, but even people that have been in the business world don't don't get it. Right. What is your job as a real estate agent? One pre listing appointment, one qualified listing appointment a day. So I, I gave a whole gamut of answers. I got to, you know, treat people well and know the market and da, 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 da. But your job as a real estate agent is one thing. Find somebody who wants to buy or sell a home and convince them to work with you. The sooner you realize that's your real job and you focus on that, then you have a much faster chance of becoming successful. That's what this business is about. Yeah. But there's so many people out there that don't make that a priority or they are not, you know, looking for new business every single day, or they just, once they get one deal under their belt, they're just managing that one deal until the closing and, and start over again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and, with that being the buy-in to, to achieve the seven figure number, why do you think it's hard for other people to do that and buy into it for the, you said four things, wake up early, work out, role play, prospect three hours, join a mastermind group. That's the key formula for a second, a seven figure agent. Why do you think it's hard for other agents to buy into that? There's a few things. I think complacency sets in for many people. And I think complacency sets in because it's different for everybody. Right. But they may not see themselves as that person. Right. They've not, maybe they weren't around it. Uh, and, 
recently, but they just really don't want to be around it in, in reality. Everyone says they want to make a lot of money, but <clears throat> not everybody's willing to go do what it takes, right? Mm-hmm. Not everyone's willing to do with the, deal with the pain. So someone said in our meeting this morning, it's painful to pick up the phone and make those calls. And I said, I said, it is, you know, if you think it is, then it is for you. You mm-hmm. think it's painful. The question is, what are you trying to solve by experiencing that pain? What do you really want? What is it that's really, really important to you? You know, and this person said, well, I I don't want to have to work at my part-time pizza job anymore, and I don't want to have to watch my pennies. I said, well, when that becomes more painful than the prospecting, you'll allow yourself to do it. And if you think that's more painful, then you may need to remind yourself it's more painful. I said, put a picture of a pizza up on your wall with a big red X through it. You know, whatever it is, a picture of a pile of money, you know, yeah. <clears throat> you could just pull from and spend whenever you want and have that be your little reminder every day when you're feeling the pain. Because most people, when they experience the pain, find it very easy to not do it. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to find things. 13 reasons why I'm not going to pick up the phone because I just really don't want to do it. Yeah. So you've got to remind yourself, what are you doing this for? And this, you know, everybody said, well, what's your big why? I never figured mine out, still haven't. So for those that have figured it out, good for you. <laughs> but you don't need a big why. You just need yeah. one little thing that you're just, that's important to you to drive you to go do what you don't want to do. Yeah. If it's a, something that's towards fear, something that's towards anger, proving someone wrong, it doesn't need to be an exact why that's towards pleasure. It could be towards fear or something else too that works. Um, I guess this question is towards, for you, uh, Ed. What do you do to fight against complacency? Uh, I've got a really bad habit <clears throat> or a good habit. Depends who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I compare myself to others. And everyone preaches don't do that. Right. Just focus on you. But I can't help it. Right. I'll find someone like you guys on a phone or an event and you're selling 800 houses a year. And I'm like, what the hell? How, how are you selling 800 houses a year? If you can do it, I know I can do it. I don't care what your average price is. I don't care. It's 300,000. If you can do 800 deals, I can do 800 deals. So that's what I look at. So I'm meeting all these people who are doing three, four, five and 800 deals or a thousand deals. Right or Mr. Florida dude doing 6,000 deals, right? Um, so those numbers blow my mind and I see them and I just can't help but think I can do that. I'm yeah. going to figure out how to do it. Well, I think there's a difference too. It's, it's you know, you can't compare yourself um, maybe step by step, but I think there's huge, uh, there's a huge difference in knowing that somebody else can do it, right? Once you see somebody else can do it, you know, whether it's the speed that they're doing it at or or the overall volume, just knowing that somebody else has done it is is immensely important to know that, hey, I can do it too. And I just need to figure out what they did and get proximity to them and learn. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with trying to reach my potential, right? What is my potential? So if someone else is doing it, I'm not at my potential yet. I got, I got room. So yeah. until I'm there, I'm... I'm just fighting for that every day. And I, I don't know when I'll turn that button off. I don't know if I know how. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you can never catch everybody, right? You, you, there's only, you know, one Bill Gates or whomever is at the top. I don't know. Some Russian yeah. oligarch, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's good to keep thinking about it. They say that your the fear is when your current self meets the potential you that you could have been. Um, and always working yeah. towards that, so you never have to be that there, that day there. Yeah. So that's good to keep in mind. Uh, Ed, what's one piece of advice that you would share if you could give only one piece of advice to um, your daughter, for example? What would be that one thing? Nothing else you could share. If you're not discovering our why, discover what makes you happy. Right? What is it? Like what what drives you to kind of this next level? And be, keep that really close to you and clear. Like with her, I find that her um, balance is incredible, right? She's got two kids. She spends a lot of time with the kids. She's home early with them. She goes on a ton of vacations. Her husband and her, you know, can, can out. He'll go golfing. She'll go out with the girls. They, they figure it out, right? So that's her happy place. 
Mm-hmm. Mine, I'm just trying to figure out how to do my business on a larger scale. And that makes me happy. So that's what I focus on. It doesn't matter that you don't have to be happy growing your business to some crazy numbers like some of these guys do or we do. Um, but figure out what it is that you do want and, and keep that really close to you. Keep focusing on it. Yeah. That'd be my best advice. Yeah, I think as a visionary, you focus is your kryptonite because it's like so many different opportunities come up to play every single day. It's like, it's hard to shut those off and put those blinders on. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, a big struggle I can imagine. What would you say stopping you from doing, uh, you know, 300 transactions? I mean, if I could place the blame on me, it would be (laughs) trying to do too many things at once and not focusing on the the right things because I have a lot of ideas that they keep coming out. I think, oh my God, that'll that'll create 50 deals. There's 50 deals over there, but you can't work on both 50 deal improvements at the same time. Yeah. Um, so if I had to pick one thing, that's probably it. So just getting control of my idea machine and picking the right ones to focus on. You know, I said to Kiro the other day, and it was in a heated conversation because we have a lot of those. We have a lot of passionate heated um, conversations. I said, you know, it's funny. I, I love the whole idea of this this EOS platform and getting the implementer was one of the best things we ever did. Uh, and that was honestly to Kiro's credit for pushing so hard on that. Um, but I said, you know what? We've figured out what our vision is for at least the next year or two, right? Like the visionary work is done. Why don't we just go out and get four integrators, right? I'm like, like you said, 50 deals here, 50 deals here. I'm like, why doesn't this integrator work on those 50? And this integrator will work on those 50. And then, you know, just come back and tell me when it's all done. But it's, <laughs> yeah. apparently it's not that easy from what I'm it's finding. It's not easy. Yeah. It, and it's easy to find people that are doing it really well and they make it look easy. But I guarantee it's, it's I know it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going through it. So, but it's fun to watch and learn. Yeah, we were shadowing Josh uh, a couple months ago. And as we were going through his office, the same procedures were very similar to ours in terms of how you fill out like a coming soon form and stuff like that. And John would look at it. He's like, you could see the look on his face. It was like a kid on Christmas. He's like, you see, it's the same thing we have. And then he was like, what about these processes? And he's like, yeah, you know, it's never perfect. It's always a work in progress. And then John's just like, you see, everybody's going through this beautiful chaos. <laughs> it's not yeah, only us. Everybody's <laughs> office is messed up somehow. <laughs> yeah. It's never going to be perfect. Well, you sort of think when you put somebody like a Josh Barker on that that high of a level and, and you know, you go into his office and it's just going to be rainbows and butterflies and there's no issues and and no problems and, and uh you know, in a sick sort of way, you, it, it's uh, it's comforting to know that other people are, are human, are, are are fighting through the same things at, at probably just a much much higher level. So yeah, um, yeah, it's awesome, uh, awesome, yeah. Ed. Well, listen, if anybody would like to get in touch with you in the future, what's the best way for them to reach out to you for referrals, for masterminds, for for anything of the sort? Yeah, um, my sales three ten four two seven two four one four. You Google my name, it'll should be up almost everywhere. So pretty easy to find. Yep. But yeah, that's great. Awesome. And if you're in LA and you see a license plate called It's Sold, that's Ed. Uh, that's so me. so honk at it. <laughs> awesome, Ed. That's our, that is our website, It's Sold, I-T-Z-S-O-L-D. So that's that's the other, uh, yeah, easy great. to find me. That's great. awesome, Ed. Well, we know your time's valuable. We really do appreciate you spending some time with us today. And I think uh, everybody watching this will certainly appreciate it as well. So thank you very much for, for spending some time with us today. I got three pages full of notes. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much.